It was April 12, 1968, at 10.45 p.m., when a tow truck driver on his way to his last call of the night was flagged down by a man who appeared out of the dark. The bloody man told the tow truck driver that he had been shot and needed to go to a hospital. At 11.15 p.m., when patrol officer Boone arrived, he recognized the man now lying in the middle of the road, lit by the cabin light of the tow truck. It was Robert Chester Jackson. Everyone called him Chet. Jackson was the owner of Chetson Motors in downtown Springfield. Officer Boone asked Mr. Jackson who shot him and where his car was. Jackson said he didn't know. At the hospital, Jackson was able to give a few more details. He said he left a Boy Scout meeting around 8.30 that night, and while walking back to his car, he was approached by a young man he didn't know who engaged him in conversation and then asked if he could give the young man a ride. Jackson said he and the young man drove around Lake Springfield. He added that they did not park at the lake. At this time in Springfield, Illinois, there was a law in place that prohibited folks from hanging out at Lake Springfield after dark. The ordinance was aimed at preventing the area from being used as a lover's lane. Mr. Jackson said he remembered a gun being pulled on him and gunshots, but he couldn't remember any of the other details. When the police went through Jackson's possessions, they found a money clip containing $210, about $1,600 today, a watch, a Masonic ring with a large stone that appeared to be a diamond. Mr. Jackson had been shot three times, in the back, the lower abdomen, and the left forearm. Jackson was taken into surgery, and an all-points bulletin was issued for his car. At 5.22 a.m., an officer on patrol found Mr. Jackson's car across town from where Jackson had been found. The car and its passenger were pulled into a parking lot. Inside, John Stephen Parisi, age 19, was asleep behind the wheel. Mr. Parisi was placed under arrest and searched at the scene. The officers found Jackson's driver's license and credit card in Parisi's pocket. They found Mr. Jackson's wallet and lighter in Parisi's pocket as well. When the officer searched the car, he found blood on the driver's seat and Jackson's sports jacket neatly folded on the back seat. Inside the jacket pocket, the officer found Mr. Jackson's wedding ring. Outside the car, there was blood on the left back bumper. At the scene and in police custody, Mr. Parisi readily admitted that he shot Jackson, though he said many of the details were fuzzy. In his account, Parisi said he met Mr. Jackson a few days before when he had gone into Chetson Motors to look at used sports cars. Parisi told the police that he had given Jackson his phone number so that he could be contacted when new sports cars became available. A few days later, while walking downtown Springfield, Jackson drove up alongside him and offered Parisi a ride, which he says he accepted. Parisi says that he thought that they would drive around Lake Springfield, but Jackson drove down a secluded dark street instead. Parisi said Jackson stopped the car, pushed the driver's seat back, placing his hand on Parisi's crotch, saying, John, I'd like to blow you. Parisi says he declined the offer, and smiling, Jackson told him, if you don't let me do it, you'll have to walk back to town. Parisi told the police that the threat of being stranded in the middle of nowhere, four miles away from town, made him, quote, blow up and lose it. Parisi said he remembered some sort of struggle and gunshots, but all the other details were fuzzy. At 10.20 a.m. on April 13, 1968, after several hours of surgery, Robert Jackson died of his injuries. He was 36 years old, married, and the father of three children, the eldest of whom was 10 years old. The murder of Robert Jackson and the trial that followed helped to define how the homosexual panic defense, as it was known then, would be used in courts across the United States for decades to come. So it might surprise you to learn that the theory of gay or homosexual panic didn't start anywhere near a courtroom. The theory of homosexual panic was part of a wide-ranging study called psychopathology, researched and written by Dr. Edward Kempf. In 1920, 
While working as a clinical psychiatrist at St. Elizabeth Mental Hospital in Washington, D.C., Dr. Kemp began to document a number of his patients who, in his view, were latent homosexuals. Kempf claimed the tension between erotic desires for same-sex partners and the revulsion at the idea of being homosexual created in some patients a range of debilitating psychological disorders Kempf identified as homosexual panic. These disorders ranged from sexually explicit audio and visual hallucinations to paranoia that the patient's food and water were contaminated, causing their same-sex attractions. In the more severe cases, Kempf noted bouts of temporary paralysis, fainting spells, and brief losses of consciousness. The claim of fainting spells and a loss of consciousness would play a role in the John Parisi defense. The gay panic defense theory was roundly criticized and dismissed when it was published in 1920. The other troubling aspect of homosexual panic being used as a defense in a murder trial is that Dr. Kemp barely noted any cases of violence. And when violence was present, it most often was in the form of self-harm. So how does a discredited psychological theory become a legal defense that lingers to this day? The 1960s in a good old-fashioned backlash, that's how. Gays and lesbians were already being hunted and kicked out of the military in the 1950s. But the 1960s gay liberation movement, inspired by civil rights activity, sent many institutions and older Americans into an angry, defensive crouch. Lawmakers began weaponizing statutes on the books to punish and shame being queer out of existence. Sodomy laws were changed to define any sexual activity between same-sex partners. Same-sex couples were arrested for dancing together or leaving a bar for the supposed purpose of having sex. Lesbians were harassed and often arrested for dressing, quote-unquote, in men's clothes. These laws were accompanied by articles leaked by police departments and printed in newspapers, often naming names, jobs, and home addresses, resulting in the loss of employment, housing, and sometimes even in the custody of children. So when Robert Jackson was killed in 1968, homosexuality was ripe for exploitation. Being gay or lesbian was a crime across the United States, a mental illness within the psychiatric community. And so the stage was set for a defense that exploited a jury's fears and hatred, and the homosexual panic defense was born. Though John Parisi confessed to shooting Robert Jackson, by the time the case went to trial, Parisi's defense claimed that he was suffering from homosexual panic when he shot and killed Mr. Jackson, brought on by Jackson's unwanted sexual advance. The gay and trans panic defense has evolved over the years. Now it's more of a self-defense or a provocation defense with a component of mental disturbance to further explain the loss of control. But in 1968, the defense went something like this. First, you had to establish through psychiatric examination that your client was suffering from a mental illness. Having established that, then you could assert a homosexual panic defense. Parisi's defense hinged on two things. First, persuading the jury that his fears and his revulsion of his own latent homosexuality collided with Robert Jackson, a married father, scout leader, and successful businessman by day, who led a secret life of sexual depravity at night, a collision that culminated in an explosion of unintended violence, resulting in Robert Jackson's unintentional death. The second part of the defense was establishing through witness testimony that Robert Chet Jackson was a closeted homosexual. Well, that was the plan, but the entirety of that defense would never be heard by a jury. Two months before the trial, Robert Jackson's brother, Bert Jackson, a private lawyer representing the family, and Mrs. Carolyn Jackson, Robert Jackson's wife, requested and were granted a private conversation with the trial judge in his chambers. The family's lawyer read this prepared statement to the trial judge. 
I represent the widow and three young children of the deceased, and the nature, I am informed and believe that the nature of the allegations will be devastating to the character and reputation of the decedent. They are untrue. The family asked the judge to exclude any evidence that Robert Jackson was ever involved in homosexual activities. The judge took their request under advisement and issued a ruling stating, Although the court recognizes that evidence of homosexuality can be very important and would be admissible, the court would nevertheless enter an order prohibiting defense counsel from mentioning Jackson's homosexuality in or outside, meaning to the press, of the trial. This was a devastating blow to Parisi's defense. How do you persuade a jury that you reacted in homosexual panic if you can't offer proof that the man you killed had a history of previous homosexual activity? But things would get worse for the defense. During the first day of voir dire, the trial court asked members of the potential jury pool the following question. There may be some evidence in this case of homosexuality. If the evidence should show any person whose name comes up during the trial of this case was involved in acts of homosexuality, would that fact alone create prejudice or sympathy for that person? According to court records, one of the jurors said, You can't expect me to say that this isn't going to make any difference to me if this man was a homosexual. The newspaper account said, no jurors were chosen on the first day of the trial. This was just as well because on the second day of jury selection, the trial judge reversed himself and announced that he would no longer ask jurors about their ability to be objective in a a case involving homosexuality. This meant that None of the 12 jurors finally selected for the trial were asked about their views towards homosexuality. On the third day of the pretrial, the defense told the court it had three witnesses who were prepared to testify to having either seen or participated in sexual activity with Robert Jackson. This evidence was offered as a way of establishing Mr. Jackson's reputation and proclivities, The trial judge ruled that he would prohibit this testimony, and the trial began. The defense opened with the statement, Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, our client, John Parisi, the 19-year-old boy that sits here at the table, has authorized us to tell you that his hand pulled the trigger of the gun that killed Robert Jackson. When John Parisi pulled the trigger of the gun that killed Robert Jackson, he did so while repulsing a homosexual attack. One of the first defense witnesses was a court-appointed clinical psychologist who testified he found Mr. Parisi to be a highly delusional, paranoid schizophrenic, who was a bisexual loner with a basic distrust of people and who suppressed his emotions, causing periodic blow-ups. He found Parisi to be a highly latent homosexual who would avoid homosexual situations like the plague with strong feelings of inferiority. The psychologist further testified that severe stress of any type could result in acute schizophrenic reactions with accompanying amnesia. During this schizophrenic reaction, the individual comes apart and becomes insane for a period of time. That description is right out of Dr. Kemp's homosexual panic theory, almost to the letter. A second court-appointed psychiatrist defined homosexual panic as a fear reaction precipitated by psychological trauma, such as a homosexual advance. When asked how Parisi would respond in such circumstances, the psychiatrist told the court that the person, because of his repressed homosexual feelings, loses control and acts purely instinctively quote-unquote, like an animal, causing the person to be unable to control the nature of his acts. This out-of-control reaction would be followed by the mind disassociating from the act of murder, which could lead to a state of amnesia. Homosexual panic, the psychiatrist concluded, is a mental defect and symptomatic of mental disease. 
On redirect, the prosecution got the homosexual panic psychiatrist to admit that homosexual panic was not a mental illness, nor was it part of the psychiatric nomenclature. The state then put on Parisi's best friend, William Watson, to testify to having had a conversation with Parisi a day before the murder, when Parisi came to his house asking to borrow money to pay the rest of his hotel bill. Watson didn't have any money to loan, and in response, Parisi said to him, if nothing else, I can always roll a queer for money. Aside from being arrested or being physically assaulted, one of the inherent dangers of being gay or lesbian at this time was the possibility of being rolled or robbed for money. Think about it. You're almost certainly not going to go to the police, and the robber knows that. On cross-examination, Parisi's lawyer got Watson to acknowledge that he and Parisi both used the expression roll or rob a queer in a joking manner in the past. Watson also agreed that at the time he thought Parisi was joking. Then came the moment everybody was waiting for. John Parisi took the stand to testify in his own defense. As he had from the night of his arrest, Parisi told the same story with a few more details. He said as he walked along a downtown street in Springfield around 9 o'clock in the evening on April 12th, Robert Jackson pulled up next to him and offered him a lift, which Parisi said he accepted. Parisi said he recognized Jackson because they had been talking about sports cars at Jackson's automobile dealership a few days earlier. Parisi testified that Jackson soon stopped, purchased gas, and paid in cash with a large roll of bills. And after driving around the streets, Jackson pulled into a secluded gravel road. He turned off the lights of the car, moved the driver's seat back, putting his hand on Parisi's crotch, and he said, John, I'd like to blow you. Parisi said he turned him down. When asked what Jackson's response was, Parisi said, that made me mad. His attorney asked, what made you mad? Parisi responded, he was smiling and telling me that. Parisi continued, and that's where it ended, right there. I remember struggling. I just kind of blew up, went crazy. I don't remember exactly or in any way anything that happened after that, except we were struggling. And then I remember driving in circles in his car, and there just wasn't anything to it, nothing I can pinpoint or tell you direct. His lawyer asked if he remembered robbing Mr. Jackson. No, sir, Parisi said. When asked if he intended to kill Robert Jackson, Parisi responded, no, sir. On cross-examination, the prosecution called Parisi's reputation into question by getting him to admit that he lied on a job application, that he had lied about belonging to a veterans organization. As for Parisi, other than admitting to the killing itself, he testified that he had stolen the gun used to kill Robert Jackson just a few days earlier when he broke into a garage. He admitted to shooting the gun off in his hotel room, in his words, to make sure it worked. The second part of Parisi's defense was dirtying Robert Jackson up by offering proof of his hidden Jackson's hidden sexual activity with other men. Parisi's attorneys were prepared to present to the court three former inmates to testify that they had either had sex with Robert Jackson or had witnessed Mr. Jackson holding hands and kissing other men in places where gay people gathered. But due to the judge's exclusionary ruling, none of the witnesses were allowed. This left the jury with the impression that the prosecution had created, that Parisi shot Robert Jackson in a failed robbery attempt. The prosecution summed up its case by telling the jury, Parisi set out to rob Jackson, and the murder was a product of that and that alone. Any claim of mental illness or homosexual panic were Parisi's attempts to avoid responsibility for the taking of a human life. The last witness to testify was Mrs. Carolyn Jackson. She was asked about her married life and her three children. The jury was left with the brutal reality of a family bereft and shattered. After five days and 35 witnesses, both sides rested. It took more time for both sides to present their summations than it did for the jury to come back with a verdict. On January 17, 1969, 
after deliberating for two and a half hours. John Stephen Parisi was found guilty of manslaughter in the death of Robert Jackson. Somewhere along the line, the death penalty had been taken off the table. The state instead asked for a sentence of 50 to 90 years. Mr. Parisi received a sentence of 40 to 70 years. A newspaper account at the time said, on hearing the verdict, the youth who had been stoic throughout the trial slumped in his chair and his head hit one of the pillars in the courtroom. Perhaps the stark reality had finally hit him. Though, if John Parisi could have seen into his future, he might have maintained his stoicism. If a trial is where responsibility for a crime is decided, appeals are where precedent and law are made. Immediately after his conviction, John Parisi began to craft his pro se writ of habeas corpus. At first, his appeals fell on unsympathetic ears. One attempt was rejected out of hand because the justices refused to hear a case that involved homosexuality and the homosexual panic defense. Parisi's luck would change in 1983 when the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit in Illinois took a look at his case and ruled that John Parisi's rights had been violated on multiple grounds. The court found Parisi had been denied an extension to file documents needed to have his case reviewed, a courtesy extended to inmates writing pro se appeals. But all the other findings involved the trial itself. The justices called the trial judge's decision to allow the family's in-chamber request to exclude references to Robert Jackson's sexual activity with other men ill-advised. I think when an appeals court calls a decision ill-advised, it's the same as one of us calling something a boneheaded move. The justices found the trial judge's decision to exclude the testimony of the three character witnesses to be particularly damaging to Paris's defense, because during the closing arguments, the prosecutor stated, no evidence has been presented that this man, Mr. Jackson, is or was a homosexual. You know... It's very easy to accuse somebody of being homosexual. The dissenting opinion in this case gives you a window into the thinking of the time. Although it would violate the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment for the state to prevent Parisi from putting on a defense at his trial, it does not follow that any exclusion of relevant evidence is a denial of due process. Parisi wants the evidence admitted in order to bolster his defense of homosexual panic. It is no business of mine whether the state of Illinois chooses to recognize a defense of homosexual panic as a subcategory of the insanity defense. But I cannot believe that the Constitution of the United States requires a state to allow defense counsel in a murder case to defame the murderer's victim as a homosexual. Evidence of reputation should be gathered based upon contact with the subject's neighbors and associates rather than upon the personal opinion of the witness. According to this justice, the threat of violating one's constitutional rights is preferable to casting a murder victim as a closeted homosexual, not to mention the idea that the only people who are worthy of giving testimony about your reputation are your social equals. Aside from being an extraordinary historical document, this dissent mischaracterizes Parisi's defense when it came to the barred testimony of the three witnesses. Remember, being gay was against the law in 1968, which would have meant that Robert Jackson's alleged sexual activity was a crime, making Robert Jackson a criminal. The dissent aside, the majority concluded that the failure of the federal district court to even consider hearing a case involving homosexuality, and because the trial judge had excluded the three witnesses, Mr. Parisi had been prevented from presenting a competent and relevant defense, depriving him of his 14th Amendment rights to due process. In concluding, the majority acknowledged normally an incarcerated person should remain in prison until the process had run its course. But Parisi's rights had been so badly violated, they ruled in the interest of, quote, judicial expedience and in the, quote, furtherance of justice, Parisi should be released immediately. And with that, 
After spending 14 years of a 40 to 70 year prison sentence, John Parisi was freed in 1982. It seems that homosexual panic had been woven throughout the trial, ending with a result that neither the prosecution nor the family could possibly have wanted. After the trial, Robert Jackson's brother, Bert Jackson, took over the running of Chet's and Motors. Jackson's widow, Carolyn, and his children faded from public view, which I'm sure they were grateful for. As for John Parisi, after his release, he moved to Georgia and then to Mississippi, where in 2001, he was convicted of armed robbery and aggravated assault on a law enforcement officer that resulted from a chase with the police. Parisi was sentenced as a habitual offender because of previous convictions in Illinois and in Georgia. He was sent to prison for life. One of the reoccurring thoughts I've had while researching and writing this episode is, what would have happened if the American Psychological Association, the justice system, and the religious and civic institutions of the time had focused their considerable influence on examining and sharing the root causes of hatred, fear, and intolerance. Think of all the suffering that might have been avoided. What if Robert Jackson and John Parisi had been allowed to live their lives more authentically? Maybe the events of that awful April night may never have happened at all. Gay and trans panic may not cause a person to kill, but homophobia has been the cause of too many deaths. For that reason alone, I think it's time to end the use of homophobia and transphobia to justify violence and murder. Thank you so much for joining me for this first episode. I'd love to know what you think happened that night. Only two people know for sure. But I've lived with this story for so long, I would love to know what you think. You can check the link below to see if the gay and trans panic defense are still being used in a state where you live in the United States. Please subscribe and like the video. Your support for these sorts of stories is vitally important. Thank you for joining me. See you next time.